plenty of seats down in front. I only th throw small objects and nothing's wet. So, so go ahead and move up to the front. This isn't like a Gallagher show. You don't need plastic sheets or, well, depends on how excited I get, I guess. Um, it's a little odd, they changed it up. They've got this spotlight, four microphones. It's like I'm in an interrogation cell outside of Baghdad somewhere. Um, my name is Ron Oglesby. Uh, I work for a company called Unidesk, but I always preface it with this isn't a Unidesk commercial. Actually, I've been doing Bry Forum sessions uh, since the first one in Silver Springs, Maryland, way back when. This is uh, Bry Forum 12 now. I uh, started off the first year we were doing this to give you guys some context. I was the guy that did uh, the ESX versus uh, Zen server and the terminal server uh, on bare metal versus terminal server on ESX, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm only doing one session this year. But to give me a little context, because I've been editing my deck for like the last three hours, sitting back in the speaker's room, adding slides, removing slides, trying to change the way I was going to go with this, because I've done a variation of this presentation the last couple of years. So give me a little context. How many of you in this room saw this session last year? Just a handful, okay. How many of you guys have already deployed a production VDI system? Okay. Out of those ones that already deployed, why are you here? This is how to solve those problems. Are you here because you have problems or are you here because you're trying to stop problems before they happen as you expand? Yes? Okay. Anticipating problems. Anticipating problems. Anticipation of death is worse than death itself. Um, and VDI is perfect for that because most people don't anticipate. So I'll give you a little context about uh, my ever-changing slide deck. Uh, I came into this, I started with my original deck that I've modified my, uh, minutely the last few years. Uh, originally when I started doing the kind of why it was server vert so easy and so great and everyone got promoted and everything was wonderful and unicorn dust fell from the sky and whatnot. Why did VDI fall on its face and my boss is pissed off? I focused a little bit on personalization, a little bit on gold image management, uh, some of the limitations of brokers at the time. As we've come forward, fast forward three, four years now, VDI has come a long way when we talk about brokers, when we talk about image management and cloning, and things like that, and the problems have begun to change. The problems have begun to change. I used to just talk about disk I.O. and how you could solve uh, disk I.O. at the storage level, and we would talk about arrays and caching. Well, there's actually completely new paradigms in storage, uh, such as local storage, converged infrastructure, hybrid storage in the arrays, and of course, the VDI workloads are no longer day one, hey, go do this in my call center. Right? Call centers are easy. Everybody's the same. I don't care what they're doing. I just have to give them a base level of performance. Uh, so instead, I started shifting and I said, you know, what happens to people now isn't the easy stuff that brings them down. It's the hard stuff. And that sounds silly. You know, of course, it's the hard stuff, Ron. But what I mean by the hard stuff is it's the stuff that isn't readily apparent just like that. My video is choppy. My end users use applications that are graphically intensive, and it gets better when I add them to virtual CPUs to all their VMs, but for some reason, my density on my servers is now decreased, and therefore my cost has increased, and now my boss is mad again. And these are things that change. So I changed my deck today uh, for like the fifth time and made a few modifications, uh, and I, you'll see it has drifted heavily to hardware, uh, talking about memory and memory that you assign to the VMs and their impact on storage. Talking about CPU and video offload cards and things like that. Some things that I commonly see every day uh, that hopefully will help you out as you look at this. Now, if you have a topic that I don't hit at all, you know, you're anticipating a problem, at the end of this, say, your presentation sucks, man. You didn't talk about this. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'll be happy to try to talk about it. And if I don't know anything about a topic, I, I don't open my pie hole. Uh, so with that said, what we're going to talk about, uh, you know, I, I left this line, I almost removed this first line, why is desktop virtualization on hold? I almost removed it because two or three years ago, that was a, an exact true statement. You could walk around to all of these large uh, organizations that we're trying to implement and everybody had a damn VDI pilot, everybody. 
Everybody had 20, 50, 100 users somewhere in VDI, and they never got past that. Now you can go around and, and ignore all the VMware hype, the Citrix hype, the concept of, oh, I got 28,000 users at this guy, and Goldman Sachs has this many. And, you know, if we, even if we ignore the hype, you go everywhere, there are a lot of production VDI systems out there. The reason I left that line in here is because there's a lot of stalled VDI projects that are beyond those simple use cases. And I want to talk about those specific ones. I want to talk about the key issues that people fall down on, the things that I hear from customers, the things I see in the field. We're going to talk about personalization. Uh, I happen to work for a company that does VDI stuff. We do gold image management. We use a technology called layering. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about layering today. Uh, but we're going to talk about where people fall down in personalization and the different levels of personalization you can apply to different use cases and different users within your environment. And we're really going to talk about kind of uh, how do you get past these? What are your options? We're going to talk a little bit about storage, a little bit about converged infrastructure models, uh, a little bit about personalization, memory CPUs, things like that. But I want to preface it and talk about why was server virtualization uh, so successful and kind of what led us down this road uh, to VDI being seen as not uh, so successful. Brian and I actually have an ongoing argument. Him and I have been friends for going on 12 years now. Wrote two books together, did all types of fun stuff. Um, Brian wrote a book called The VDI Delusion. Anyone read it? All right. You look at that book and you would basically come away and you read some of Brian's articles that Brian's a VDI hater. You know, And he's not necessarily a VDI hater, but what he gets mad about is all the places that VI, VDI has been force-fed and crammed into as a solution, and it's basically was a solution looking for a problem versus a solution to a problem that someone had. Serververt was simple. Serververt rocked. It took a bunch of servers and made them into a few servers. That was it. That was it. Right? For all the rigmarole and all the things, I was that guy that used to go around and used to do the assessments on your servers and tell you how much CPU and which ones could be virtualized and which ones couldn't. And we all spent a lot of time and money looking at assessments and, and doing this consolidation. But for all of the work that we did in server virtualization, it was a simple conversion. We changed form factors. We took it from a rack server at one point, right, to a pizza box at one point, to a blade that was a pizza box turned on its side, and eventually we took them into virtual machines. User pushback, the actual end user accepting your change, did we argue with app owners? Yeah, we argued with app owners. Look here, dude, you're not getting four sockets and eight gig of memory for your you know, machine that runs a batch process once a night. Right, we argued with them. But to users, that change is really different. So on the serververt side, we'd make this conversion. We'd be easily, easily set up to actually show CapEx savings, right? We'd take a server that used to cost five grand by the time we racked and stacked and get it into a VM and it's costing us a grand. OpEx savings was just a byproduct. It was great. And of course, those same people that were running those projects or sponsoring them projects, they stepped up the corporate ladder. Now there's this human nature there's this habit of humans that when something is successful once, they go and they try to repeat it somewhere else. And there was a lot of push from uh, VPs and bosses and CIOs that said, boy, we sure did save a lot of money and consolidate all these servers. Can I do it on my desktops? And they went back and started trying to force feed VDI in the early days down people's throats. And it actually caused a lot of damage in VDI. It put desktops and virtual desktops and these early protocols and brokers into bad positions, which led us to a lot of bad taste in our mouths when we talk about VDI. So what happens in VDI? Why is VDI on hold? Why do projects get stalled? Why do you go into pilots and, uh, you know, it takes forever to get out of pilot and you're making constant adjustments and all this? It's cost and complexity. VDI is not simple. If you think, you know, VDI is just simple, it's just not. There's a lot that goes into it. And any complexity in any IT system feeds into cost. Every time you add another gear, that gear costs money, not only to implement, but also to maintain. And VDI is the king of complexity. Questions just pop up. 
You start designing a VDI system, you start talking about brokers, by the end of the day you're talking about you know, high performance disk subsystems and caching models and how big is my network pipe to this location. And these things just add up. It's everything from what is the user using, do they install Google Toolbar, all the way down to, oh, what's the block size on my VMFS volumes over here? And all of a sudden that poor desktop admin that's just trying to make it simpler to manage their desktops winds up answering so many questions about stuff he has no expertise in, the project goes out the window. CapEx is almost impossible to show in VDI. It's almost impossible. You know, by the time you go through purchasing disks, purchasing high performance servers, buying licenses for Vue, buying licenses for a hypervisor, buying licenses for Unidesk, buying license for AppSense, buying a zero client, getting that onto the network, upgrading the network because the video is chatty. All of a sudden, your $1,000 PC you used to jam under someone's desk starts looking pretty attractive cost wise. OpEx is really the only savings. Now it can be significant, but almost nobody shows OpEx savings to their boss because their boss, the first answer is, oh, you're going to save me one FTE? Who can I get rid of? You, right? No, not me, man, <laughs> right? The other thing is that the desktops have to be moved. Right now, this guy is sitting here, he's got a laptop and all that, and somewhere he has a user that has a laptop or a desktop just like this. And they open it up and they sign on and they're happy. Right? Freaking happy users. That's what we all want. Do you guys know what a server is to an end user? Anybody know? I'll tell you what a server is. A server is whatever is at the end of that wire. They don't know anything other than that. They plug into this magical blue cable that comes out of a hole in the wall, and they get to their server. A desktop is not like that. A desktop is theirs. They can see it. They can touch it. Even if it's virtual, they can make changes to it. When we P to V'd servers, how many of you guys were P to V guys doing server virtualization? I was a plate spin fanatic. If you got step past step six, you were home free on a plate spin migration. There's a guy that did plate spin. But the cool thing about moving it when we moved a server was we made a copy of it. Nothing changed. Some disk drivers got swapped out, a network card got swapped out, every bit, byte, Every installed app, everything was the same from A to B. Do we go to a user's desktop today when we implement VDI and we take their desktop and clone it and bring it up into the cloud and make it this beautiful thing? Go, look, now you can get to it from anywhere and it's just like you left it. No, we're taking something away from them. It's a big pushback there. They have to be moved and they don't like standardization. We like standardization. They don't like standardization. This is a big thing. And of course, there's a lot of secondary products that go into this. Um, I love VMware, I love Citrix. I was a Citrix guy for a lot of years. Was a VMware guy after that. Very rarely will you walk into a shop where they have bought only VMware. That's it. Oh, I bought VMware and VDI is now in. Often there will be secondary products. AppSense, RES, right, before uh, VMware bought RTO, they would buy some type of profile manager. Uh, there's always some type of client involved, right? Whether you get a, a zero client, uh, you get a, a client from Pano, you get a wise client, there's always all these other components. And so it's not simple to buy. And that leads you into your first thing, knowing that you're stepping into this world that can be complex, before we talk about how do we make it simpler, is do you have a desktop virtualization strategy? The biggest thing you have to ask yourself before implementing VDI is why am I putting in VDI? Does VDI fit your project? You know, I, much to my CEO's uh, uh, chagrin, I've had a couple of customers, I flat talked out of VDI because what they were trying to accomplish could not be accomplished with VDI. You know, you could force feed it in there, it'd be kind of okay, but it would not be great. And guess who they're gonna get mad at at the end? The guy who implemented it or the guy who tried to sell it to them. So you have to ask yourself a question. When I go to implement VDI, first off, does it solve my problem or does it just move my problem? Right? Am I trying to solve a specific problem? I'm moving for security. Okay, there's some reasonable stuff there. You've moving, you're moving the apps, you're moving everything central, the whole screen scrape thing, you're only getting uh, screens down there. Um, well, I'm moving for management, but I'm gonna do one-to-one -one desktops. 
Well, if you're moving for management and you're gonna do one-to-one -one desktops, you're essentially taking your existing management infrastructure, if it's the problem, and moving it into a virtual world. And then you have to ask, are there other options that are out there besides VDI that fit better? This gets totally ignored by consultants constantly. There's a lot of good consultants that'll tell you, oh, you should do that with Terminal Server and ZenApp and be happy. Oh, you should just virtualize your app and stream it to your desktop and be happy. But there's a lot of consultants that are, hey, just buy this and it'll fix you. So look realistically at your problems before you ever go down this path we're about to go down and say, does terminal services fit it? Does app virtualization make me better? Does, can I do this on client-side virtualization? And then you can start getting into all the pain. So let's start with CPUs. Uh, I used to have this whole spiel. I went through uh, a lot of the problems and then I talk about ways to mitigate it. What I've done now is essentially pared this down so that we can jump right into, okay, Ron gave me the warning. He gave me the FBI disclosure up front. I'm here because I am doing VDI. What are we gonna talk about? Let's talk about a little hardware first. Let's start with CPUs. CPUs are interesting, uh, not only uh, in a VDI world, but overall because of all the things they do. They're so integral to what goes on in uh, an operating system that we as computer guys, we don't even think of all the things they do every, anymore. But in VDI, they're really interesting because what happens in VDI is we look at a server and we look at existing workloads. Maybe it's a terminal server workload. Maybe it's a, a server virtualization workload. And we expect the CPU tax to be taxed in the same way. But desktops, tax a server CPU completely different than server virtualization or even a single terminal server is going to. And the trick for us is always trying to increase density on these VMs. Uh, any vendors in here? Anybody works for Dell, HP, anything like that? Cisco? Cisco is my favorite to pick on. I'm going to pick on Cisco. Love Cisco servers. The blades are really cool. They're really dense. They're badass blades. Understand all that. Uh, really interesting thing, I have actually had Cisco guys sit in front of me, tell my customer, no problem, you get this 230 blade, you can run 150 to 175 of your desktops on it. Yeah, and he's whistling. They are looking at things and saying, look, the way to get these people to buy it is to shriek the price per unit, price per desktop. The optimal config performance-wise is to have a lower number of desktops or a lower ratio between VMs and, and cores, virtual CPUs and cores. The optimal config cost-wise is to have more VMs, more vCPUs per core. Our job is to find that point where we get enough performance that our users don't gripe and the cost is low enough that it makes sense. So first thing you're gonna wanna do, don't go cheap on the processors. This is a common mistake. You buy today's server with last month's processors. You've just traded, you've just traded yourself out of the most high performance processor. But while you're doing that, go to the second bullet, trade cores for speed. One of the things about ESX or any hypervisor is that it can only schedule one virtual CPU per core at a time, right? So if you imagine that you had eight cores in a box and I had them lined up here as eights and I had 16 virtual machines on that box, only eight of those virtual machines with one vCPU each is actually using a processor core. And what happens is it swaps them out, right? That means for optimal density, you need more cores. You can't say, I went from 2.2 gigahertz on this to three gigahertz on this, therefore I'm gonna handle more VMs on that processor. That's not how it works. There's an inherent overhead in the scheduling mechanism moving VM A off and moving VM B in. This actually shows up in something called CPU ready time, which we're gonna show in a second. I also wanna hit a little bit on video CPU impact. Uh, this is a big talk lately. Um, how many of you are running Windows 7 virtual machines for VDI right now? How many of you have dual virtual CPU VMs? Why do you have dual virtual CPU VMs? Because like he likes his video to work. Okay, so here's the cool thing. 
Video, especially anything, you do a lot of healthcare, don't you? Yeah, especially anything in healthcare where there's high res images and things like that, taxes the CPU. Normally in a physical machine that goes through a video card and a processor there and all that stuff. Well, in a server, it's actually taxed in two different ways. Now, a lot of times people go, Ron, I'm gonna go buy this PC over IP offload card from Teradici and I'm gonna jam it in there and my video performance is gonna get better. The CPUs are actually taxed in two different ways. The PC over, P off, P, PC over IP offload cards actually offload protocol functions. The actual compression of images and readying of images to be sent down the pipe back to the client. Now, if you ever look at any of this on a uh, Teradici site and you look at their videos, what they tell you is one of their cards can handle up to 64 machines, VMs, running on your host at any one time offloading their PC over IP functions. And that means that you could probably run 120 or more VMs because it's, you're hard pressed to find that all 60 or all 120 at once are gonna be actually be taxing at the protocol level. What they kind of skip over, but if you talk to their engineers, you'll learn to understand, they do nothing of the video card functions, right? We think about our gaming machines and things like that we put in PCs or really high-end video cards and guys that are doing video editing and high-res stuff. All those functions, if you just get a PC over IP card, get tossed back onto your normal CPU. Thus, he puts two CPUs, and you see this a lot. People go, oh, my Windows 7 VMs feel snappier. They feel better when I give them two virtual CPUs. That's because they now have more horsepower to handle video. So the second thing that you could do if you have actual video intensive applications is to look at, uh, and I don't even know if they're selling them. I tried to get one the other day and it's not happened, uh, but NVIDIA has got a, yeah, I haven't seen them been able to sell yet, but they, they are developing with VMware an actual server-based video card to offload the video card math to that function. Here's the other thing, if you go to dual vCPUs in your Win 7, because you can't buy these, these, you know, the NVIDIA card's not out yet, so you can't buy it. Uh, but you can't buy them yet and you're not ready, so you go to two CPU VMs. I wouldn't say you've cut your uh, server density in half, but you've probably cut it by at least a third, maybe close to half, right? If you could have done 60 VMs on those servers, you're now going to do 30 if you were processor constrained. And the reason is fairly simple. We don't think about it a lot because we always think in this uh, terminology of VMs to host or VMs to core, but what it really is, is virtual CPUs to core or virtual CPUs to host. When you double your virtual CPUs on your VMs, you don't change anything else. You're actually increasing the amount of overhead that I was talking about when scheduling and descheduling VMs off of those processors, that context switch there. So that becomes a real interesting thing, overtaxing the servers. I just had one this morning, it was really fun. I was on the phone at uh, 8.30 this morning in my hotel room upstairs. Performance is bad, Ron, everything's in the toilet, blah, 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 typical stuff. And so I get on the phone, these are smart guys, these are not bad guys, they're good VMware guys, they're good desktop guys. We started talking, and I'm like, you know, you guys have been running this system for like two and a half months, what changed? They actually doubled their number of dual processor VMs on the system and nothing else. The high ratio of vCPUs that they threw at that system had taken their, they had about a four to one ratio, four to one vCPUs to actual cores, had taken it up to six vCPUs to actual cores. And now a bunch of their users were complaining. So we logged in, we started messing around. What do we find? ESX ready time or ESX top, we'd go in and look at the ready percentage on a bunch of these VMs and they were 10, 15%. Now there's this little counter called ready, percent ready. If you're running ESX, you can, uh, you used to be able to get through a console with ESXi, you have to use the console tools. But what it really means is the percentage of time the VM is waiting to get scheduled on the CPU. That's it. Single digits, four or 5%, not bad. You really don't notice it. But when you have 70 VMs on a, on a server and you're looking at that list and the top 10 or 20 in that list are showing 10, 15, 20% percent ready, 
That means that 20% of the time that machine is demanding CPU, it's waiting to get scheduled. They've just blown up their uh, vCPU to core ratio. He went back, started changing them. We shut down some unused VMs. All of a sudden, those times started coming down. And on some servers, there's this interesting speed step issue. I've seen this on HP and Dell. Uh, for some reason, I run into it more on Cisco 230s. I don't know why. Uh, and it's really easy to troubleshoot. Uh, you think your v VMs are a little sluggish. Uh, things are just not as fast as they should be. Pull up a Windows VM open three or four command prompt windows and use this high-tech command called dir forward slash s. It'll run a directory right off of the root of C, right, to every, every subdirectory. It'll eat up all the CPU in the VM. Go to task manager. If the VM says 90, 95, 100%, go out to virtual center, look at the performance tab of that VM. If it's at 50%, you have the speed step bug. Now, in UCS 230s, the way this showed up was you'd actually go in there and you'd set up a new profile and you'd turn off speed step and hyper threading and power, you're trying to do all that, you'd reboot the machine and it'd come right back. They actually have a BIOS and a firmware upgrade for the 230s because those buttons were benign, they did nothing. The actual problem is that I have eight processors or eight logical processors and two local processor cores or sockets the aggregate CPU load of one VM going to 100% wasn't enough to step up all the processors. So their code actually kept all the processors stepped down. This happens all the time. Memory. Memory is always my favorite. Let's start with defining your memory uh, settings up front. One of my favorite things is to read uh, vendor white papers that talk about their, their density, right? They ran this test. I got 982 VMs running Notepad on this one server, so therefore you can get 982 VMs also. One of the things to do is to read the fine print on those things. A lot of times you'll see they were running a bunch of Windows 7 VMs at, no kidding, 768, sometimes one gig, real low memory. Your users aren't gonna be happy. I don't know, my Windows 7, every time I put one gig on there, I open two applications that starts to tell me I must increase the memory or page file and I have to shut the machine down. The problem with this is when they under-design memory up front and you go and you purchase servers, a lot of times, and it's, it's a financial decision, I understand, but a lot of times you're purchasing the server, you've done calculations based on one gig, you say, okay, I need this many gig, I get the cheapest DIMMs I can, right? So I get two gig or four gig ones, I populate all the slots, then I roll out my VDI servers and I wind up increasing my memory on my desktops to two gig or three gig or four gig. VMware's transparent page table sharing and memory overcommit and all that's great stuff, but it can't keep up with that much. So design your machines up front and actually commit to what your memory is gonna be. The second piece of this, and this burned a, a college down in Tennessee, was a lot of times people don't think about or talk about memory impacting storage. Who here can tell me how memory impacts storage? Anyone? V-swap. Who here has been burned by the V-swap killing their storage? Oh, no one raises their hands. Come on. We've all been burned by it. So let's show you a little thing here. VMware creates a V-swap file by default for every VM. And by default, that goes into a folder where the VMX file is created where the VM lives, right? <laughs> By default, this is the amount of signed, assigned memory. So if you have four gig virtual machines, there is a four gig vSwap created at power on for that VM. Uh, the actual math is the difference between the minimum memory setting and the maximum memory setting. The default, of course, when you create a VM is that minimum is zero and maximum is whatever you created, four gig, two gig, et cetera. Now, of course, you can go back later and try to change these Right, you can write a little PowerShell script if you want, a little PowerCLI script that goes out and sets the min up to reduce the size of the vSwap. Uh, that's one option to get around this. But when you do that, if you're under committed on memory or if you're over committed on memory, you don't have enough memory in the box, now you're starting to mess with your DRS stuff that's going on. Do I have enough in an HA event or even in DRS? I've set all these mins which means I have to allocate X amount of physical memory to this VM or to all these VMs 
In an HA event, can those VMs restart? In a DRS, can I move things around enough? You can start to mess with that pretty bad. The other thing is that Windows needs a page file. Uh, this is an actual example from a customer. Uh, they had a four gig of memory machines. They had to do it. They set their page file at two gig inside Windows. That means six gigabytes of swap for every desktop. Now, they went back and they, were, they didn't calculate this. Their poor consultant didn't tell them that their thousand desktops that they were building were gonna require six plus terabytes on their new array that they just bought that only had eight and a half terabytes writable of page file. That was a real fun conversation that I had with them explaining it to them. And I'm sure it was a fun conversation for the consultant when he called back the consultant. Now, if he had just left you know, a four gig page file even, think about that, eight plus terabytes. If you're even paying $10 a gig, eight plus terabytes gets expensive. All that stuff you think about your gold image and how much persistent disk space you're gonna give them and all that, generally, VSwap is one of the bigger pieces of storage being eaten. And there's a couple of ways around this. Uh, this is just a image of a VSwap file on a four gig machine there. There's some other interesting tidbits around this, such as machines being powered on and powered off and these files being created and creating some thrashing and stuff like that. Uh, but the big thing is generally cost and actually eating up that storage. So besides running some scripts or setting minimums to set the memory minimum up to reduce the size of the page file, you can also go to a host-based VSwap. Can slow down vMotions and some other things, but you can go to a host-based VSwap that allows you to put a VSwap file for the host on the host using local storage. Keep it off your centralized storage. There's actually some interesting tricks out there, like this one here, where you can do a swap to host cache, which is basically putting that uh, swap on local SSD. That's actually really interesting if you're gonna do a lot of memory over commit. Because now that swap file, instead of being slow rotating disk, is actually fast SSD, a lot closer to memory speeds. Uh, these slides will be available, you know what, if, if you want. Uh, my Twitter ID is at the end and beginning of this. If you just hit me on Twitter, I'll email you the slides directly if you want. I'm no big deal. Yeah. I was reading an article the other day that said you could eliminate the page file. Yeah, my ass. <laughs> Sorry. I was in the military. Things pop out of my mouth like that. Um, my boss tells me I have no filter even when I'm in meetings with him. The, um, the concept, what he had said was he was reading an article where you could eliminate a uh, page file, Windows page file. In theory, you can. You can go in and turn it off. I've never seen a successful implementation of it. I'm sure there are some. The problem typically for me that I, that I see, or, or that I, the resulting problems I see, I always track back to Windows and it's, it's just proclivity to wanna to do preemptive paging, right? It's not out of memory yet, but it's paging anyway, because at some point it may be out of memory, so let's page this out. And it's essentially the best way I've had described by a, guy, by a guy from Microsoft who I had brought this up to a few years ago was that Windows needs to breathe, man. That's what he said. Windows needs to breathe, man. <laughs> he had dreads too, man. This guy was so funny. Total kernel architect. He's like, man, it needs to breathe. Just let it breathe, man. <laughs> um, so if anything, page. Let it do its preemptive paging, but do it to fast disk. Now, typically, its preemptive paging is not thrashing. It's not doing it constantly like in a memory overcommit situation within Windows where you've assigned it two gig and it's trying to use three. In that case, it's constantly going to disk like it was RAM. If it's doing preemptive paging, it's much slower, right? It's doing more continuous blocks of info. It's not thrashing the disk in that way. I probably wouldn't try to run it without page file, but I think you got that, right, from my opinion. Disk I.O. How many of you guys have read countless articles on VDI and Disk I.O.? Everybody's got a headache from hearing about that. And I've got my little pictures of SSD and Fusion I.O. here. Uh, disk I.O. is a common problem. There's a bunch of technologies that can reduce footprint. A bunch of technologies that can reduce. Unidesk reduces footprint. You know, Link Clones reduces footprint. Zen Desktop with PVS reduces footprint. The interesting thing is that reducing the footprint exacerbates the I.O. problem. It exacerbates it. 
Let's throw some numbers out there just so we can talk about them. Let's assume a desktop uses 20 I.O. I'm not going to get into read-write uh, split yet or RAID penalty, but let's assume a desktop uses 20 I.O. on average sustain. Great. An average rotating disk, 15K, can get you about 180 I.O. Okay, great. You know, not including a RAID penalty, just thinking about the disk, I could probably put anywhere from six to nine VMs on that one rotating disk, and it would handle the I.O. at 20 I.O. sustained average across those guys. Great. If I was using a full clone machine, full clone, 30 gigabyte Windows 7 image, and I cloned it six times, let's say, that's about 180 gig. Wow, well that seems to match, Ron. You know, I can get a 300 gig drive. Maybe I can get those nine VMs on there. I can take it up to 250, 270 gig. That's just right. Then you throw VUE or Zen Desktop Provisioning Server or Unidesk on there who shares gold images, and you reduce the amount of footprint down from 30 or 40 gig of VM down to eight or 10 gig of VM. Now that same disk capacity wise, footprint wise, could get 20 or 30 VMs on it, but it doesn't have the IO for it. So our own uh, asking of VMware and everybody else to share disk images to swap out has exacerbated this IO problem underneath. We continue to make things thinner because we don't want to pay for capacity. And then EMC comes back and gives us the you know, EFD that costs us four times as much as everything else. IO can't be just shrunk that way. It can't be made to disappear, right? There's some interesting technologies out there. We're going to talk about them. Who here, anybody use Atlantis, know about Atlantis? Atlantis got cool stuff, man. IO acceleration, they're doing like IO dedupe and all that stuff. Not going to take anything away from Atlantis. But really, what comes from a desktop, from an I.O. perspective, is what it is, and we have to build a disk subsystem underneath to deal with that. On top of it, the read-write ratio from desktops is completely different than your server environment. You may have a bunch of SAN guys that you're trying to convince that, yeah, you need to build this certain disk subsystem, and they're using models that are based on 80 or 90% read and 10 or 20% write, and you're sitting here looking at a desktop report that says, I'm running about 50-50. Well, so what, Ron? They're still I.O., right? The difference is read I.O., read operations, going down from the desktop, hitting the disk, incur what we call a RAID penalty, right? If I have two disks in a mirrored set and I send a write, it's actually written once to each one. That's two writes. That one comes out, goes into those as two. If I have a RAID 5 volume, you typically incur a 3 to 4x increase in the write operations. So again, we'll use simple math. You have desktops that have 10 IOPS sustained, 50-50 split, 5-5. Five, five. You're going, oh, they're, they're 10 IOPS each. No, in your planning, what you need to do is it's five read IOPS, and then it's five times whatever my RAID penalty is on the right IOPS. So let's say you, we're going to do a simple RAID 5 volume. It's five times four. That's 20. Now I've got 20 plus my original five reads. That desktop is now at 25 IO. The factor, the, the delta between what's coming out of there and what's hitting the disk is substantial. So you got to design for this up front. You've got the big storage vendors uh, with their different caching technologies. You've got NetApp, you've got EMC, FastCache, they've got all these different things. The question I always tell people when they're talking to a vendor, regardless of who it is, let them describe their caching technology, let them talk about how great it is, let them talk about the price point, the first question out of your mouth when it comes to VDI should be, how do you handle right I.O.? If they are selling you a card that's this unbelievable caching thing, but all it's doing is read I.O., you're in real trouble. Ask them how they're handling right I.O. coming from the desktops and how big, whatever that right cache is, how big it is. What happens when I fill up that right cache because I get lots of rights and you're not used to it, sustained rights? There's also these man in the middles like Atlantis. Uh, the interesting thing about Atlantis is it essentially sits logically between your ESX servers and the storage on the back end, whatever that is. They also have a diskless mode from what I hear now, but I haven't researched that a lot. And the idea with Atlantis is that the I.O. doesn't hit the actual disk, not all of it. They actually see requests that are duplicate for duplicate files or blocks of data, and they send it back from their appliance back to the VM so that I.O. never got to the disk, and they can do a bunch of dedupe uh, de of I.O. there. But regardless of what type of, of disk you're using, 
The key is to actually handle that. Now there's a few different things. We're gonna talk about hybrid arrays. Anybody here running a hybrid array right now? Equalogic XVS, XS, anything like that? Okay. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about centralized storage. You should look for what we call mixed or hybrid arrays, which I'm gonna to get to in a second. And we're gonna talk a little bit about local storage. Local storage can be used to keep costs down. How many of you would think that every VDI desktop should be on centralized storage? Really, come on, nobody's gonna raise their hand? <laughs> I understand because a lot of times we get sucked in on the virtualization side to say, look, I use this for my servers, I use this, we put VMware on here, put your VDI images on there. And I went into an environment, I kid you not, the other day, they were really struggling with their cost per desktop of storage. And so we're talking about it and I go, well, let's, you know, why don't you give me a tour of your data center? We'll chat while we're drinking coffee around your servers. And he was real pleased with that. So we're walking around and he's showing me, you know, he's got these arrays, he's got these servers. You know, I see some old pizza boxes over here. I go, oh, what are those? Those are all my old uh, Zen app servers. They're running my EMR app and this and that. And I go, oh, okay. And uh, those are the boxes that you're using for VDI. He goes, yeah, that, those boxes in that gigantic array. And I go, are you running any of those ZenApp servers on the SAN? He looked at me like I had a third eye growing out of my head. He's like, no. He goes, that's all local disk. I go, wow, why aren't you running your VDI desktops on local disk? Again, he looked at me like I had a third eye growing out of my head. A desktop is a desktop is a desktop, right? He was using non-persistent VMs, put them on local disk. It was an option to him that they completely ignored because the host box happened to have VMware on it. Hybrid storage. Uh, I think hybrid storage is the key to VDI today. It will be for the next several years uh, until uh, enterprise class SSDs continue to grow and come down in price and we, we standardize more on those. But for the next several years, it'll be hybrid. Hybrid storage is simple. Uh, hybrid storage is a mixture of SSD or some type of solid state device whether it's like a Fusion I.O. card or a, you know, an OCG Z drive or whatever, and then some type of rotating disk. And in this model, the SSD is there simply to provide I.O. That's it, right? Each drive can supply thousands of IOPS, therefore let's let them do that. The problem with SSD is they're fairly small because they're expensive. So you throw some rotating disks next to them, that's cheap. Now what you need is logic. Typically, these are sold in a box. Let's use uh, Equalogic as an example. Uh, you can also use Tintree if you want to go off-brand. Tintree uh, Storage Systems has something like this. But the idea is fairly simple. These are all in one chassis. There's software inside of them that can actually present volumes that are mixed between SSD and the rotating disk up to ESX. Just looks like a normal data store. Looks like a normal LUN. Your actual VMs are doing the reading and writing from that data store. They don't know what's underneath it all. What happens underneath in the hybrid storage, the intelligence, is that when something gets hot, when a block of information gets hot, it's actually moved from the rotating disk over to the SSD so that it can be read from there. So now I have the I.O. where I need it. But the cold stuff, as data gets cold or as it's forced out because it's the slowest thing in SSD, it actually gets moved off to rotating disk. You now have the I.O. coming in the front end. It's like a gigantic cache, but it's not just read. You're actually handling the writes. And this is where you ask that follow-on question. That red movement requires that the array be running for a little while so they can actually figure out what's hot and not and move it there. So then you say, well, what happens to the writes? Right, they're reading from there, blah, blah, blah. But when I write, what happens? You want them to answer that in some way it's going to SSD first and then being played back on the back end. You can ask other questions too. You can also ask when we're talking to an array vendor, you can say something like, okay, when something gets cold and gets moved out or something gets hot and gets moved back in, how soon does that happen? What size of data is that? Some people have very small. They do it you know, down at the block level. Some people have it very large. They do it at like one gig is the minimum they move and they cut everything into one gig blocks and move them around. So ask them how efficient they are at that and what it does. The cool thing is that this doesn't have to be in an array. It doesn't have to be. 
Anybody here ever use ZFS? Like one guy? I feel like such a geek. Um, yeah. Oh, C2. No, no, I'm not alone. I'm buying him beers later. Um, I'm the geek with servers in my house, right? I, I can't help. I do, have a, I do have an old Solaris box. That's geeky. Uh, most of them are HP and some Dell, but I'm the guy with a 42U rack in my basement that, you know, my wife looks at my power bill and almost divorces me. So this is what ZFS also does, right? This isn't rocket sciences. Could you build this yourself? Sure. Could you put a Fusion I.O. card in something? Could you put some rotating disk in a local server and run ZFS on it? Sure, you could. It's probably not as efficient, not as great as what, you know, an actual storage guy is going to build. But let's take it a step farther. There's now these concepts out there called converged infrastructure, which is where everything is kind of together. It's not, you know, oh, I've got some servers and then I've got some storage over here. It's all together. Uh, guys like Nutanix are putting Fusion I.O. cards and spinning drives all in the same server and allowing their logic, their storage logic, to handle all the disk I.O. and stuff just like this, but in the actual local server. Uh, so centrali centralized, a couple of good examples. I did Tintree, I did Equalogic. There's all the big boys. I didn't feel like I needed to advertise for NetApp or EMC. And local, sto local storage is actually where it gets interesting. We're going to talk about Nutanix in a second. There's also an option when we talk about disk I.O. and storage to get to local storage. SSDs people often will sell, but you should be aware of these three things. And I know I'm going through a lot of info, and I know my clock. She's going to start flashing the 10-minute warning at me soon. Um, SSDs have their drawbacks. Uh, one, they're expensive. Two, they're small. Their failure rates on consumer level SSDs will probably keep you from putting them in the servers. Uh, consumer class SSDs are called MLC drives. Uh, there's SLC drives also, but they tend to be two to three, sometimes four times the cost of an MLC drive. Uh, the real trick is that an SSD can only handle so many writes. Because it's solid state, when it goes to write to something, it has to wipe out that little spot on the RAM. It has to write back in there. It can only do that so many times. So a lot of them actually have software that do things like write leveling and garbage cleanup and all this other stuff. But the trick is it can only write to that spot so many times. And then it fails. Now, MLCs, if you put one of those in your in your iPad or, or iPad, in your Mac, in your HP laptop, six years from now, you wouldn't even know that the thing was having, you know, little spots that were failing. But if you take that same MLC drive and jam it into a server that has 50 desktops onto it, now you've just cut it, their time, their life expectancy by at least a factor of 20. Thus, the short mean time between failure. You can go to SLCs, uh, but they're more expensive. The trick is to look for the new drives that are called EMLCs, Enterprise Class MLCs. They're going to be a little more expensive than the MLCs, but they're going to have a P number at like 12 or 13,000, which is four or five times the life expectancy of an MLC, but it's half the cost of an SLC. So if you wanted to use local storage, that's an option. Or you can GM lots of rotating disk in there. You know, just some quick math here as an example. You can't do this if you have blades, but basically if I had six drives and doing rough math that, that could handle about 200 I.O. each, and I had 50 desktops at 10 I.O. using that 50-50 split on read-write ratio, I've got about 1,250 IOPS. I'm right about what six drives could do. If I can get eight drives in there, I now have eight spinning 15K drives, could handle those 1,250 I.O. So you can have to, have to do the math for yourself. The other option is you actually mix the two, either SSD and um, rotating drives, or you get something like a Fusion I.O. card and you mix with rotating drives. And what you typically see, we'll see a Fusion I.O. card jammed into a server, serving up hot data, and you'll put all this other stuff, the vSwap, the Windows page file, all that kind of transient information that doesn't get a lot of pounding, onto the volume that's on the rotating disk. And this is the converged systems play that's out there. Uh, these are actually interesting. They're, it's a very, very interesting model because it combines server resources and storage resources into one box. Uh, Nutanix combines it into a, I, they call it a block, I think. It has four servers in it. 
Uh, V3 is a little different. And then there's another one called Pivot 3 that I didn't put up there just because I don't know enough about Pivot 3. But here's the difference and here's what you need to ask them. How is their redundancy done? V3 Systems does redundancy through automation. What that means is if you're running a big VDI shop and you're using Vue or Zen Desktop or something and your uh, V3 server goes down, one of them, they detect that and then they go out and automatically spin up extra desktops on the other servers and shove them into the pool so that you get a recovery that way. Nutanix does this cool thing where they actually create local resilient storage. So if I've got cluster node A and cluster node B, they're using local storage, they're actually replicating that over here. And then they present that local storage to the ESX cluster as just a volume. The cool thing about that, host A goes down, the storage is still up on host B. And if things get moved, they'll be talking to the, the VMs will be talking to that storage there. As they rebalance to different hosts because of compute and memory requirements, it'll actually follow, the storage will follow those VMs and keep local to their, where they're at. So it's a very interesting model. You'll actually see some of this coming out from HP and Dell, I would guess in the next 18 months, two years. They, they have to play catch up, right? It takes a little bit of time. And now of course, personalization, uh, my favorite. This is another big stumbling block. To understand personalization, we have to understand the difference between what we see and what the user sees, right? What we see when we think of VDI is that. Right? That little perfect desktop that we got just the way we wanted it. It only has my apps on it. It's got a folder on it that has my tools so I can remote view it and do everything. And we don't even just see one of those, right? We see thousands of those, right? They all look the same. Everybody's happy in my little world where users never touch their desktop. Users don't see their desktops that way, right? Oh, you have a few of those guys, right? You've got one that looks just like that. Uh, he's probably in his late 50s, he doesn't like the computer, right? He doesn't have a cell phone, and we use him to do a lot of IT testing, right? We've got that guy. <laughs> he doesn't change anything, we're very happy. Then you've got that guy, right? Works in accounting, makes a few changes, changes his desktop background, tells you how hip he is. He found iTunes last year. We all seen that guy. <laughs> I noticed you had a slide just like that. In your, in your deck earlier. Got, I mean, look at that, you, we all know that guy. We know that guy, right? He's got all types of stuff open and he's running, he's got his own personal uh, script editors and stuff. And then we've got Mr. Upgrade, right? The guy who tried to upgrade his system, your system, his system for you to try to save you time and energy, right? We've got that guy. They are attached to their desktops. And personalization and the different personalization solutions out there vary in what they can actually catch and handle. So I'm gonna start at profiles. Everybody, you know, I was, in, um, I was in Portland once and I was doing a session on profiles and I started it off, group about this size, and I said, man, we're gonna talk about some profiles today, you know, and people were, you could tell, they were already sweating and upset just because I said profiles. And I said, you know, Redmond's up the street, man. I got a bus outside. Who wants to go up to Redmond with me and kick the guy who designed this right in the balls? <laughs> and man, the hands went up then, right? They were all ready to go. So we all know generic profiles. We've all been there roaming profiles, et cetera, et cetera. There's also this other class that I sometimes call super profiles, right? The super profiles are out there. Uh, the RES uh, software, the Liquidware Labs, the AppSense. Of course, I got Sapago and RTO up there, to be honest, right? Citrix and VMware bought those. Everybody has a profile tool. And they do a lot of different things. The, the basis when we just talk about profiles for a second is that they'll all grab the profile. Uh, VMware's view persona. It's what I call profile streaming. It isn't gonna allow you to go out there and grab you know, crazy data files and big sets of data and you know, do lots of custom things and only do it by one application or anything. But it's gonna stream the profile and allow you to have a faster login with a roaming profile. Liquidware Labs, somewhat the same. Uh, the interesting thing is as you move up the stack of super profile managers, you get to things like AppSense, where you can actually go in and configure it to just save these specific settings for this specific executable. And you can get very granular and set up config files and all of that. 
So these are good tools, but they only save stuff generally that's in the profile or things you specifically specify outside. There's also technology called layering that's out there. And I'm gonna go ahead and be nice. Uh, Citrix bought RingCube about 18 months ago. Uh, layering technology, when it comes to personalization, is very simple. It's a file system, whether it's a drive or whatever, a VMDK, that is attached to the VM, typically above some type of shared image model, whether it's PVS or Unidesk or whatever. And anything the user is allowed to do, anything they do, is saved in that VMDK. And unlike a Delta disk or something like that that you see with block-based provisioning, like, you know, link clones, when you swap that gold image out, the layer is laid back on top. And so even Google Toolbar, Visual Studio, registry entries outside of the profile, all of that is just retained. There's no configuration, it's just all retained, right? The trick is to make sure that whatever tool you buy actually has a conflict resolution mechanism between the block-based images or their downstream images and the one on top. If you really need user-installed apps, the kind of tier one way to go is some type of layering mechanism. And then, of course, there's what we call capture and replay from a user-installed app perspective. And these are apps that run as like an agent inside the VM that watch for someone installing something. Someone double-clicked on iTunes setup.exe, someone downloaded WinRAR, and they actually watch to see, okay, it's installing something, redirect these things someplace else, capture this install. When they log off, the, it's a non-persistent desktop underneath, it gets refreshed, they log back on, their profile loads, and then it starts playing back this application into their current desktop. I've got some benefits and drawbacks on that. Uh, AppSense has one you can download. I was just told, I almost kicked the guy out in the booth. Uh, he, oh, it's still in beta. Things been in beta for like two years. Um, but it's available for download. It's gonna be free. And of course, Liquidware Labs have one that call, that's called Flex Apps. But the benefits of the Super Profile is they can capture almost anything. Uh, and if you specify it and say, I want this directory or I want these files, you can even grab those with a Super Profile. They're faster than standard roaming files and almost, roaming profiles in almost any case. And their big benefit is they generally reduce the number of running VMs you have to have because they're based on a non-persistent model. They're based on the desktops underneath being wiped out. Therefore, if you have 1,000 users but only 500 concurrent, you only have 500 desktops. You don't have to have a persistent desktop running. Drawbacks is that they often require detailed configurations uh, of settings to save these things. You actually have to have knowledge of what you want to save. I actually have a guy that worked for me that worked for AppSense for a while. His job was to go places for two and three weeks at a time and configure every one of their apps to save only the settings they wanted to save. And, you know, it was time consuming. And they do not pick up things that our users expect a lot today. Web controls, uh, plugins, user installed apps. Uh, he had mentioned in his session just last hour about uh, a team, a uh, VDI group, that had some execs that were on link clones that had customized their desktop and put in web controls and probably went to a WebEx or a GoToMeeting. And so the IT team just stopped updating their gold image because every time they recomposed the desktop, those things got flushed. You know, and that kind of uh, was interesting to me because I've had the exact same thing uh, with, a, with a Wisconsin uh, uh, department and their state government up there they didn't recompose their desktops for almost six months because every time they did it, they had so many help desk calls, they actually shut down the help desk line one day because so many people called in that WebEx was gone, GoToMeeting was gone, uh, this web plugin from this other state agency was gone, and they just had to stop doing it. So you have to judge the level of personalization. Layering's an interesting thing, can capture anything the user does, doesn't matter what it is, profile, web plugins, uh, web controls, all user installed apps. You could install Visual Studio, you could install antivirus, doesn't matter. It'll actually capture it. Uh, the key with that is because layering is there when the machine boots. Uh, it doesn't have any of those problems. Minimal configuration, you just pretty much turn it on or enable it, whether it's RingCube or Unidesk or whatever. And login speeds are really fast, just like the super profiles, because you're actually using a local profile, just like a normal desktop, you're not using a roaming profile at all. Drawbacks, if you're using layering, it's a one-to-one -one desktop. You might get the benefits of storage reduction, you might get the benefits of single image management, 
But if I want to give everyone in this room a persistent desktop feel with layering, everybody's going to have a VM running in the environment. Right? I'm not going to be able to say, well, 10 guys logged out, so 10 machines were broke down. Whether it's a personal VDisk with RingCube from Citrix or Unidesk or whatever, you're going to have those machines running. Uh, some layering tools are separate from the OS provisioning. Like Unidesk World, uh, we OS provision, we do apps, and we do layering. So we do the whole stack. Uh, Citrix World, they use provisioning server underneath and then RingCube on top, VDisk on top. So you have to decide, do I want to use two tools, do I want to use one? And it can definitely, if you go with a different tool, like even a Unidesk, it can change the way you're doing your OS and app provisioning. So if you're already in bed pretty far with PVS and uh, let's say app V, or you're pretty far down the path with link clones and thin app, uh, yes, you probably have some apps you can't get done with thin app, but it might shift and say, well, I've been using Composer, now I have to do this Unidesk thing or whatever. So you want to decide a little bit of that up front. And the final thing on personalization, uh, record and replay for user installed apps. They can generally capture most apps. Uh, the, the, the Strata apps, the Flex apps of the world, they can generally capture most of the apps. If you run iTunes, if you run WinRAR, it's probably going to be fine. Uh, where they stumble down is things that have low level boot services. They're going to fall down there. Certain web plugins are not going to work. Uh, because it's actually not a standalone app, it's integrating with some other app. There's some places they're going to fall down. Uh, and AppSense's piece, uh, when it's not in beta, uh, can actually sandbox the app. It's an interesting concept where the user installs it. He doesn't even have to have admin rights because it goes into a sandbox that's separate from the actual image itself. A little more complex, but it's there. So they won't capture all the apps. Uh, my big knock against these is I'm already in an I.O. constrained environment. I'm already in a login sensitive environment. I already have a roaming profile. Now I have to play back my applications after I'm already logging in to get icons to show up on my desktop and stuff. You can actually lengthen the login store and time and increase the amount of I.O. traffic at login for users. So it can be a, uh, an interesting thing. Couple of things you need to know about Windows as you venture down here. Uh, don't just know the legalities of Windows licensing. That's been beat to death. You can go to Brian Madden's site for that. I don't even write on licensing anymore. I get, like you gotta get a lawyer to write on licensing anymore. Uh, what I like people to think about is activation. So many of us get used to just popping in that, Emma, that TechNet license and cloning a machine real quick and everybody's happy. But when you get into large scale places, know how to use KMS. Know how to use Mac with KMS, right? Know how to actually set these things up or even retail licensing and understand how that's going to work. Understand the different licensing model. This is a big thing. And the other thing is you'd be surprised at the number of desktop admins that have never written a, a command script or never written a, a small VB script. And it, it'll save your life in VDI. So I always tell people, it puts you in a world, and do you see this? How many, do we have any higher ed people in here, universities, colleges, things like that? You know, interns are cheap, man. Uh, you know, I had some interns when I was at CMU. They were the best. I could send an intern out with a USB drive, and he could mess a lab up in like an hour, <laughs> right? <laughs> Unfreeze that deep freeze and get to town. Now I move to VDI. Guess what? There's no physical desktop for me to send that intern. There isn't. I can send them for coffee, but that's about it. So now I need that to be automated. When that machine first boots on, I want it to run this script. I want it to activate the OS. I want to make sure Microsoft Office is activated. I want it to pull down these settings. Well, I got no intern to type that in or to run my little USB stick. Learn a little bit of automation. If you don't want to learn it, completely understand. I'm done learning myself. I'm going to go find a bottle of Jack Daniels tonight and crawl into it. Find someone who wants to learn. Somebody's clapping for Jack Daniels. He must be from Lynchburg, Tennessee. I talked to somebody yesterday. They were telling me that Tennessee in Lynchburg, you can't even drink Jack Daniels in Lynchburg. It's a dry county. I almost cried hearing that. I almost cried. So learn some of these. Learn about how you're going to gain remote control of that desktop, right, to do remote assistance, VNC viewer, things like that. Know how you're going to assign printers. Follow me printing, print anywhere stuff is phenomenal now, especially on university and healthcare stuff. 
uh, and expect to use expect to use basic post build configuration scripts. Final things I'm going to roll through these common mistakes: designing your VDI hardware first. Hello, I just bought a bunch of 230 blades. What can you build with this? Start the other way. Design your environment, design your VMs, figure out what you're using it for, then design your hardware. Most common problem is people duplicating their server virtualization hardware in their VDI environment and then learning that they wanted to use local disk or learning that they wanted to completely change the way they were dealing with the network because now I need DHCP all of a sudden. Believe everything the vendors say. That's a that's the quick road to hell. Dante actually wrote that in his Inferno. Uh, gold image sprawl is a huge problem. People don't think about it. I had a university the other day had 200 seats, seven gold images, because of different configurations. You want to figure out how to reduce your gold image count, and if you have to go to a different OS provisioning model, go to a different provisioning model. Not configuring the disk subsystem, we beat that to death, and of course, forgetting about personalization is one of one of the big ones. Key checkboxes for your design. If you go back and you're designing your VDI environment, and you tell me I know how I'm doing every one of these things or how each one of these things are configured, you'll more than likely be successful in your VDI project, assuming that you've defined your use case. If you can say I know how we're doing OS delivery and updating, I know how we're delivering and patching all of our apps, I know how we're going to do personalization and who gets it and who doesn't. I know what my broker is going to be. I know how I'm configuring it. I know which desktops are pool versus persistent. I figured out my storage, and I know where my WAN and LAN users are. In every time I've went into some place that something has completely fell apart in a project, they've just missed one or two of these things, right? They didn't think about a specific user or use case that was getting it. They didn't test it over the WAN. You'd be surprised at how many times you see that. But if you've said I know how to do all these things, you're good to go. And then final hardware recommendations: I like smaller servers with more cores. Trade those processors per speed. Don't go cheap on the storage controller if you're using local storage. Uh, whatever memory you think you need, make sure you get more. More is better. It's like ammo when the zombies come from The Walking Dead. Is anybody here other Walking Dead fan other than myself? I'm always yeah, The Walking Dead. When they come back, that's going to be great. We won't even do this session next year. I'll just bring Walking Dead videos in here, and we'll just hang out for an hour with some beer and some Walking Dead. <laughs> Think about your disk in this way. Can I use local? Can I use SSD? If not, I go to central. Can I use centralized SSD? The cost actually increases as you move down that line. Build redundancy through quantity, just like the old MetaFrame days, right? I didn't care. I didn't care if. A MetaFrame server went down, other than 30, 50, 60 people getting disconnected, because they re-clicked an icon or the thin client auto reconnected them to a desktop on another server. If I'm running non-persistent desktops, and I have a profile tool or whatever, or I have VMware with centralized disk and I have HA, so I know when one machine goes down, they're just going to restart on another. You know, why can't I just build redundancy out? Why can't I use local disk in that model? Think about those things as you cost out and build your model. And she gave me the five-minute warning just as I came to Q and A. So this is open. Anything? Did I screw you up, or did I start talking about Jack Daniels too early in the day? The Walking Dead. The walking dead. Questions, comments, anything you want to poke at? <laughs>